And can I invite Colby? And look, I don't know how you did it. There's still now two minutes ahead of schedule, but there you go. Um, and the QR code, Dirk? Uh, for the turtle tracker that uh, was put up on the screen earlier by Matt, uh, the QR tag that you flashed up will be at the back of the room if anyone interested. Hi everyone, my name's Colby. I'm another PhD student with the Ningaloo Outlook program. I'm looking at movement ecology of a range of shark species at Ningaloo for my project. And today I'm gonna to be presenting a bunch of the work that we've done on whale sharks so far. So who here has seen a whale shark before in the wild? Show of hands, quite a few, all up at Ningaloo. You uh, get a few peaks and then you eat someone else's bubbles and get back on the boat. It tends to be like that, no, it's good fun. So. I, my family moved up to Exmouth in about 2010 and I've been going up sort of every single year since then. So it's a really exciting project to be a part of and to get into this amazing data set that this bunch of smart people have all collected. So I guess my point in saying most people only see whale sharks on tour boats. They're really hard to find in the wild, especially away from their coastal aggregation sites. And so it's really hard to know where they go and what they do after that. And in order to do that, we have to use uh, technologies like satellite telemetry and tagging to uh, get more data and information about what they do. And it turns out that uh, data on the tags that we put on the sharks will be beamed up to these satellites and it will eventually make its way through to, it's now internally localised in my MacBook, um, but the data is very gappy. The satellite tracks are hard to uh, collect and there's big gaps in space when the sharks don't come to the surface because the antenna has, has to actually break the surface in order to transmit. And so we've got a massive data set with really long records of information from a range of individuals that constantly record depth, temperature and positions when the tag breaks the surface. But when it doesn't, we don't know what they're doing. And so a lot of the work that I've done so far is in kind of getting the information that we have received and putting it all together and try to make some sense of that. Uh, there's been a few occasions where we've collected and recovered the tags that have been put out on the animals. So we've got four in total with a complete archive of the depth and temperature records, which is really exciting to look at. But my focus so far is being making sense of the data set as a whole. And so a quick summary, so for phase one of the Ningaloo Outlook project, the whale shark team went and tagged a total of 39 animals between 2015 and 2018. And the really cool thing about this is there was roughly equal numbers of males and females in the data. And so Ningaloo is a uh, aggregation site that's dominated by juvenile males. So the fact that we've got an interesting sort of comparison with females here, which are quite hard to come by, is very exciting. Um, we've got a size, size range in total of 3.8 metres to 9.5 total length and we managed to get track durations ranging from 8 up to a maximum of 340 days, which is almost a year, so it's a lot of data to go through. With the rough average is about 100 or so days. Uh, so this allows us to observe movement patterns of whale sharks at getting towards a sort of population level and in definitely capturing large aspects of their migrations. And so... I'm presenting now my aims and objectives. The questions I wanted to ask with the data set were, where do whale sharks go once they leave Ningaloo? It's a big question to ask. Um, and also, luckily, because the sat tags recorded depth, I also wanted to know where, what the diving behaviours of the whale sharks were, their use of depth and temperature, or vertical habitat, if you will, and how does this vary with location as well as time of the year? Uh, specifically because the data set allows for it, I wanted to look at whether there were any differences in the movement patterns due to the sex or the size of the animals and what are the seasonal patterns amongst those. So here we see all of the tracks combined from all of the sharks tagged in this study. Uh, so this is a result of a range of different modelling techniques that I've used to put together the gappy positions that we receive and estimate a rough track of where the animal could have gone. And you'll see the dots along the tracks are the actual raw positions. So there's some pretty large gaps in between them where the interpolation and the uh, estimation methods will come to a limit. But what I've managed to do is combine a bunch of different statistical methods to produce these tracks. And they show they make some pretty long transits. So we've got animals going out as far as Cocos and Christmas Islands out here, a lot going up to Indonesia around here. 
as well as parts of Papua New Guinea out here, and even one animal went all the way out to the Gulf of Carpentaria. So they've made some pretty long migrations. Um, and you'll see, so the colour of the tracks, red is for females, blue is for males, and there was one unknown sex, which you can see in the green here. But overall, there's not really any clear patterns in where they're going. It all seems to be pretty uh, random and diverse. So I'm not really sure if there's any patterns or drivers we can pull out of that, but I wanted to start looking at it on more of a seasonal basis to see if I could find differences there. So what I did next was start to look at, uh, estimate some kernel density patterns, which you could think of as like a spatial density or a heat map of where the animals are most likely to be found. And I did that on a monthly basis. Um, and so I'm just gonna cycle through these slides. So this is month of the year. Obviously there was multiple years in the study, but they're aggregated over in terms of their migration phases. So in June, they're all roughly around Ningaloo. By July, they've all gone every which way everywhere. August, they start to get a bit further out to the far reaches of their migrations. September, they're still going. October, there's some starting to return to Ningaloo and even further south, but then others are all the way over in Queensland and Papua New Guinea. We've got November here and a lot are starting to head back towards the Northwest Shelf by then. December, some have started to head as far south as Perth. The water must have been warm in those years. January, January is where uh, the female sharks, all the tags have fallen off by this point. For, so beyond there, it's all males. So in February, this is what the males are doing. March, it looks like they're back at Ningaloo for the start of the tourism season. And April, and lastly May, we had three tags left by then. So there's quite a range of migration patterns there that we see, and then you know constant returns to Ningaloo. And another thing to note is we always tend to see a high probability of whale sharks occurring at Ningaloo in all months of the year, even outside of the peak season. So I next wanted to look throughout that seasonal migration is what's the rough distance from Ningaloo between female and male sharks? Because as I said before, it is a known hotspot for juvenile males. They're fairly dominant here, but the females are not so often found. And so in this plot, again, I've colored it by sex with the red bars being for females, green for males, and this is distance from Ningaloo over the months of the year. And we can see some fairly clear differences between what the females and males are doing here. You can see even in June at the peak of the aggregation, the females are almost up to a maximum of 500 k's away from the coast, whereas males are sitting home pretty tight right on the shore. Uh, that's also the case for July and August. The females are at their peak distance from Ningaloo in August, whereas the males are only generally starting to leave Ningaloo by this point. The males reach a sort of peak in September, and they also, the males appear to return to Ningaloo much earlier. You'll see in the months of sort of December, January, February, the females are still a ways away, but um, the males are sitting right close still. So overall, the migrations, there's not really any clear patterns. Uh, some stay and some leave. There isn't any uh, you know, strong signals like in sex-specific differences there. And it could be due to a range of factors which I'm going to continue in to investigate. So the next piece I wanted to look at was their diving behaviours to understand what they're doing throughout their migrations. Um, overall, it sort of shows that they stay shallow when they're migrating and they tend to dive deeper uh, when they're not, as well as it could be sort of food related, it could be due to navigational cues, or it could just be to cool down after long deep dives. We don't really know the drivers and that's what I've started to look at. Um, but they did experience occasional dives to sort of beyond a kilometre and a maximum in this study of 1900 metres, so pretty deep diving. So again, I wanted to look at a monthly or a seasonal average and compare that between males and females. It sort of looks like males dive deeper, deeper overall, but there aren't any clear patterns in some months of the year. It's definitely uh, a, big, a difference between males and females. But um, overall, the females appear to prefer staying shallow throughout migrations, and they've got a bit of a smaller variance in the range of monthly depths that they uh, experience. So... There's sort of hints of a difference here. I wanted to next look at what their temperature use patterns were to see if there was anything else there. And what I found was the males like sort of higher temps overall, and they've got a pretty tight variance around that, so they really like their choosing and selecting those uh, temperature layers. Whereas the females experience 
a much broader range of temperatures overall and cooler than males. Um, so there is some fairly clear sex-specific differences in the vertical habitat use that these whale sharks are taking on. So temperature is obviously related with depth. The deeper you go, the colder it gets. So I wanted to understand, are these variables interrelated? Uh, is there an influence due to temperature on how deep these animals are diving or vice versa? And how does this vary? So I've started pulling together some modelling of using generalised additive models, which uh, look at non-linear responses to variables to investigate the relationship between sea surface temperature to start with and how much time the whale sharks spend on the surface. I chose this metric because it's relevant to uh, many things in terms of uh, ecology and conservation, uh, tourism. There's a lot of risk due to uh, boat strike and global shipping for whale sharks. And so it's something I wanted to focus on first. And so obviously sea surface temperature is directly related to how much time they spend on the surface. And what you see in this modeling is that um, there is a non-linear relationship. The warmer the water gets, the less overall that the whale sharks are spending on the surface. And there's some subtle differences between what the males and females are doing. It appears that the females are tending to be a little bit deeper or using the surface a little bit less overall. Um, but I will preface that the models are still in progress and I'm doing more work on investigating the drivers of these relationships, as well as other depth layers throughout the water column. I also wanted to look at size and see if there was a clearer difference there. So in red here, you've got large sharks over 7.5 metres and blue is smaller sharks. And it appears to be a slightly clearer difference between these two. And it would make sense because smaller animals are feeding on the surface, particularly at Ningaloo. Um, and as SST increases, again, the sharks are less likely to be on the surface overall. So the next steps is uh, investigating the seasonal movements in relation to both size and sex of whale sharks, as well as some further modelling of the depth use patterns that I've started to explore here. And I want to do this to identify the drivers of these differences in vertical habitat use between male and female whale sharks. So a fair bit more coding to do. Thanks very much, everyone. Just like to acknowledge everyone here. Thanks, Colby. Hi, everyone. I'm Anthea. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the data that we collect up at Ningaloo during the whale shark season. So we've been trying to work out how many adult whale sharks there are up there and we're doing this by collecting tissue, we're getting photo IDs and we're also getting length estimates. And Toby will be talking later about the genetics that we'll be using from the tissue collection. But this is more about how we collect the data. So we get photographs of the left and the right flanks of the whale sharks and we use them for, to ID individuals. We've got stereo videos from the, and get the entire shark in the footage. I'll show, show you some photos to determine the length and the biopsy sample for genetics. And we've been collecting this data from 2017 up to 2023, excluding 2020 because of COVID, the 18 couldn't get over there. Um, so we have a bunch of people in the water. There's like four jobs. We usually have at least three of us in the water. We get around the shark. It all looks pretty cool in the water, but it's a bit of a mission sometimes trying to get them. But the end of the day, we've gotten 589 individuals we've got photos for. We've got dove footage so we can get lengths for 583 there's biopsy samples for 582 sharks and all up the acoustic and satellite tags, we have 56 individuals. So basically when we're on the boat, we have Tiff from Nigaloo Aviation, who's amazing, and she will tell us where the whale shark is and she's in radio communication with the, our skipper on the boat and they get us in front of the shark. And let me tell you, when you're on the water, finding the whale sharks doesn't look like it does here, it's a lot more difficult. So she gets us in front of the shark. Once we're in front of the shark, we jump out, we swim towards the shark, we get in our positions while he's swimming along or she's swimming along, but probably a he. And we collect the data, we jump out. Takes, on a good shark, two minutes. 
But sometimes things don't always go to plan. We jump in, the whale shark goes in a different direction and we're all trying to like speed swim up towards it. Then you've got the ones that turn around and we've got some people here like this is Rich Pillins there who's just stuck right in the middle there and this shark is just going to p- move around it. This is me over here. My job's to get the left side photo of the shark, right? And the shark keeps turning. Rich is just doing a bit of a pirouette in the, mo- in the middle, not doing anything. Matt and I working hard to get our job done. We get on the boat. We are absolutely stuffed. For Rich, it's like all a piece of cake. Anyway, back in the lab, we get all the photos. So everyone knows, I'm assuming, that the spot pattern on the whale sharks is like our fingerprint. They're all unique and we use that to ID. And just like when you think about it, we use our fingerprints, but really there's probably any print on our body that we could use. They, someone decided we're going to use the, the flank just above the pectoral fin to ID that spot there, that patch there, to ID the sharks. So in the water, we our aim is to get a photo like this, one on either side. We then upload these photos to a, um, it's called Wild Book for Whale Sharks. It was already existing before this project came along. And they've got a bunch of sharks in there already. And I upload the photos and then we mark all the dots in that patch above the pectoral. So we also have to mark the gill slit and also the posterior pectoral. And that's just so the computer system knows whether we're looking at a left side or a right side. And then the image gets scanned, it goes through a growth algorithm and it matches with other sharks that are already in the database. So in this case, there were 301 other sharks that it said, oh, let me just get that, that it says that it matched with. This is the first one. It was the exact same shark. It's not always the first match is the same shark, but this one was. And so then we can get an ID from it. And this will allow us to then know that we've what the shark that we saw three years ago is the same one that we saw, saw this year. Um, for calculating the length, we have a dove that we go in. It's got two GoPro cameras inside housings. They're calibrated before we go out on the boat. And there's a CGIS software that we use and it's got software called Event Measure where we can measure the shark. So we... We calibrate the cameras, we get the film, we synchronise the tape so we know that they're playing at the exact same point of time and we mark the nose on one image, nose on the other, tail on one image, tail on the other and we come up with a bunch of lengths. So I try to get at least five from each one and as you can see here, they're all within about 10 centimetres of each other. We do um, a whole bunch of other lengths as well, which I'll explain what the other ones are. But... Ideal case, perfect. But then it's not always that easy because when you have a big shark, you've got to be further away from the animal, the visibility is pretty ordinary and it's hard to mark the exact point of the nose and the exact point in the fork and the tail. So for example, on this one, it's roughly an eight metre shark and it's saying there's about 70 centimetres in variability, which is not very accurate. So we're trying to come up with another method to get the lengths from the whale sharks. And so we do some extra lengths. We're trying to work out the relationship between fork length and the best one so far is the nose of the whale shark to the front of the dorsal fin. And because a lot of people can get that in a photo without getting the whole animal in a photo. So then if we can just use those, that length, we can extrapolate and get a fork length for the animal. So all up, the data of the years kind of looks like this. This is males and females combined. There's still a bunch of bigger sharks that we still need to calculate because we weren't able to get the full length of the shark. So that's just missing, but we plan to get there. And the final piece of data that we collect is the, the tissue sample. So this is Rich heading down. After, so after we collected the photos, we've gotten the photos and we got the length video. This will be the last thing that happens. We get a little biopsy sample for genetics and he's taken that already there. And then previously, we haven't for a while lately, 
we get a, a tag, put a tag on the shark as well, and then he swims away. So the biopsy sample is just done with a little hand spear. It doesn't seem to aggravate the sharks too much. You end up with a little puncture hole like this that you can see. And sometimes we can even see where there's a tiny little scar right there from a previous year where it's all healed over. So that was the reef shark. Um, all up, we have seen 644 sharks for the project. 305 of them we've only seen once, and that's great because it will give us lots of genetic data for Toby and the team. But there's also benefits in seeing the repeats, the resites, as we call them, because they're the ones that we can use to look at growth rates over the two, three, four, and there's one that we've seen five times now. Um, so we can get growth rates over that period of time. And there's a whole bunch of people that have contributed to this project, so thank you very much. Thanks, Anth. All right. Um, so, yeah, my name's Toby Patterson. I'm based in the snowy wastes of Tasmania in Hobart. So this is uh, very hot for me here. Um, I don't get to do all the fun stuff that Anth and Rich and the team do. I get to deal with the numbers. Um, so what I want to talk about today is how some of this data has been used um, and uh, the the actual resites. So Anth talked about, the, you know, seeing the same animal again through time and identifying that through through Wild Book, and what that means about our estimates of kind of local Ningaloo whale shark abundance, but also talk about a broader view. Um, how do we get address the kind of bigger challenges of looking at a cross sort of generational understanding of connectivity, understanding what the parent stock might be of whale sharks in the Indian Ocean. And for that, I'll sort of talk about what we want to do with something called clay skin mark recapture. Um, so as Anthea and Colby have, have given the background in detail, but just to recap, um, there has been these mark resite data that's been collected. It's uploaded to Wild Book. The project's collected a significant amount of new, new data. So what there's been previous estimates of abundance at Ningaloo. I've, I've used the data from the CSIRO project to do something similar to sort of what's been done before, estimating local abundance. Um, very simple sort of open population model where we've got numbers through time, the population is allowed to grow with a sort of a growth rate parameter. Um, and so we're, we're trying to estimate a growth rate parameter and initial abundance when we start. And also within the machinery of the model is an apparent mortality rate. So mortality here is gonna be a combination of animals um, leaving the area and not being seen again and the actual true mortality through death. And we can't really disentangle those with this sort of data. So this is the data up until 2013 uh, 2022 I think was the last one so um, I haven't actually the, the latest stuff is not in this yet but basically those encounters they get we get we we then take those encounters and look at of the ones that were say seen in 2017 um, how many were re-seen in 2017 seen in 2018 2019 in that table on the right and that's kind of the data that how it gets transformed to go into the models so the, I've, I've tried two models here, one where I allow the population to be basically constant. I'm assuming that there's no population growth. So I'm only estimating an a, a, a constant abundance and a mortality term, and that's in the top table. So around 500 animals um, with a reasonable amount of uncertainty between about three and 800, and an apparent mortality of around 75% per year. Now, when I allow the, the varying one to the, the population growth rate model, similar abundance back in 2016 when the st um, start of this and then similar mortality rate and a nominal sort of 3% per annum growth rate. But there's quite a lot of confidence, I mean, quite a lot of uncertainty on that. And it's pretty hard to say that that's actually different from zero. Um, so really this simple model is probably saying that, 
you know, the population over this period has remained fairly constant. And I should say we're not talking about age structure, we're not talking about, you know, size or sex differences in this, it's just a total lumped estimate. Um, so the model predictions, looking in the top, top right there, fairly flat, reasonably wide confidence intervals. Um, the bottom one is the recite probability, you note the 2020 COVID gap. Um, we're generally most confident in the middle of the time series with these sort of models. Um, I think I'd like to look at allowing it to vary through time as a very sort of simple model so we can make it a little bit more complex um, and look at you know, other effects on the growth rate or the mortality. Um, putting in, this, in the context of some previous work, um, uh, there's early stuff from Mark Meekin's team, sort of similar numbers, uh, depending on the model variant, sort of in the same range. Um, I guess we're sort of in the span of some of the apparent survival rates from the Holmberg studies. There were some kind of more dramatic estimates of trend from, from the Bradshaw and Holmberg studies as well, which they're pretty early on. I guess if we're seeing now numbers that are similar to the Meekin study, then maybe the trends of that magnitude might be actually unlikely, as in that population would have had to do something different and then come back to where it is now. Um, I'd, I'd say that probably it's been reasonably constant. Um, but there are limitations with this sort of, this sort of data. Um, as I've said, we don't, we don't have the broader spatial structure. Colby's shown that there's, you know, in the data from this and other studies, the SIRA data and other studies, there's long-term movements. Everyone knows that whale sharks are huge distance, you know, open ocean travellers. And we've got biases in the animals that are actually present at Ningaloo. You know, there's the, the bias towards more males, typically smaller individuals. And so we don't get to see the parent stock that is supporting this aggregation site. And if you're in conservation, the key thing, there was a question about relevance to conservation, you want to know how many breeding animals you have. That's kind of fundamental, Conservation 101. So how do we get around that? There are challenges. Um, one of the things that, um, I think I've sort of gone through some of the points there, I actually, one of the key ones is that, um, you know, the, the, stocks, the genetic stock structure for these studies that have been done on whale sharks are basically saying that there's a panmictic, a mixed structure between the Pacific and Indian Oceans. What, that can be sort of a result that is actually masking if you've got low gene flow, so there is animals moving around the place, that can make it look like it's a well-mixed population, but at a kind of population level, there's actually more structure and there's actually kind of units in the population that you need to worry about. So what we need to do really is to be able to see one, work out how many parents there might be in a population um, when we can't actually see them, we can't count them directly. Um, and we also wanna know about the connectivity structure in these populations. Um, and so Syro has been developing um, this tool called Close Kin Mark Recapture, where you take the tissue samples that Anthony has talked about, and we've done this on Various other species, um, southern bluefin tuna was the first that's now used in the management of that species, white sharks and several other shark species. You take the tissue samples and with sort of modern genomic techniques, you can identify whether you've got closely related individuals within those, um, within those uh, samples. So um, what that allows, what we can do is look at the prevalence of those individuals, the number of, of related individuals that we have compared to the total. And from that, we actually get to estimate for a fair bit of mathematics, the size of the adult breeding stock. Um, in this case, because we don't have, we're not sampling both mature animals that often and juvenile animals, we'd expect to have largely sibling pairs. So we're gonna have animals that if they are related, they'll share a parent in common. Um, so really the idea here is that the offspring kind of tag their parents through their inherited DNA. Um, and with mitochondrial DNA, which is only inherited down the female line, we can look at that in conjunction with the nuclear DNA and say if that animal is, or if the two animals that are related as half siblings share a mother or they share a father. 
Um, and then by knowing the age gap between those animals, so if we get the growth rates and we get an age estimate, um, we can then say that the parent must have survived over the intervening period between animal one being sampled and animal two. And that gives us a signal on the survival rates of the adults. So the process really is sampling, genotyping, which gets done by uh, diversity arrays in Canberra. This is the folks that we use for that. What we call kinference, which is our statistics to work out which animals are related. Um, generating aging estimates from either length or things like the epigenetic aging that was, was talked about um, in when Matt discussed Ben's work. Um, and then all that data goes into a population model, which is not in some ways not entirely dissimilar to the Mark Resite model that I talked about earlier, but there's many variants on how you do that. And from that, we can get some estimates of the number of animals, number of breeding animals. So as a kind of cartoon, apologies, they're not whale sharks. Um, you've got breeding animals at the top. They generate offspring, the purple ones at the bottom. The arrows indicate, you know, a female and a male that, that have produced a pup. And then if you get the, if you can sample those, you'll get what we call pops, parent offspring pairs. But you also, by just sampling the juveniles, you'll see which ones are related that share a parent and are half-sibling pairs. So in this case, we're probably going to be dealing with that situation. We're not going to expect a lot of parent offspring pairs. The other thing that we're really interested in that I talked about is, is the, um, the connectivity, how the Australian population might be related to the broader region. Um, we know there's obviously, everyone knows there's these aggregation sites around the Indian Ocean into, into the Indo-Pacific. Um, yet, and while, while I think Rich told me that there hasn't been a sighting of any of the wild book data or any of the wild book animals that have been photographed at Ningaloo, they've never been recited at any other aggregation site. So even though we've got a, a panmictic or a supposedly, you know, a mixed stock, there's no actual evidence of animals going between these sites. And the satellite tags that Colby talked about are really useful at understanding stuff over medium time scales, but they don't give you that really long term 15, 20 year data on how these animals are connected, which is, you know, at least what you need. So what we want to do on this, and this is kind of the hypothetical as to how this is going to work when we get into this data, which is going to happen soon, is we're sort of looking to see what, what, what patterns we would see in this data. And we've done this on, on other species, um, tiny tuckers here, we've done this on flatback turtles. We've kind of got a situation where mum and dad meet somewhere. We don't really know where that is necessarily, so that's the ones in the middle. And you could have different different ways in which those parents support the various aggregation sites that feed animals into them. So in this one, maybe that maybe there's one breeding stock that supports the entire Indian Ocean aggregation sites. Who knows? We'll find out, hopefully. If we saw that, then we would see half-siblings across all those sites that we can get data from. Um, we would also see some half-siblings related within those sites, but we'd start to see spatial connectivity through the sibling pairs. Um, if we had, you know, they only support some of these sites, then we would see connection between some and not others. Um, and if they were all discrete parental stocks supporting these, then we just wouldn't see any cross um, or shared, shared sibling pairs. So the difficult part, We've got a lot of data from Ningaloo, thanks to the efforts of the, the, the field team, uh, which is fantastic. The difficult part is, is getting the data from overseas. Now, um, we're engaged with, with various groups. So Pierre Fertry, who's on the, the team, is kind of leading the charge to, to deal with uh, the fairly onerous CITES importation um, stuff with assistance from Anthea and others um, that goes with this. Um, and so working, we've now got... Um, access to samples from Madagascar, um, thanks to um, collaborations with Stella Damont from the Marine Megafauna uh, Foundation. And through Claire Preble and Alexandra Watts, we're hoping to get further ones from Tanzania and sort of looking at how we can access even broader samples from around the Indian Ocean and the Pacific that Alexandra is working on as well. Um, but even if we don't get, you know, huge numbers of samples from other places, I think I'd argue that 
understanding the kin the kin pair relationships within an Ingaloo aggregation site is going to be quite informative. Um, for one thing, if that population is only you know if it's supported, if there's 500 in, um, individuals there, say, and they're supported by common breeding stock, then we're going to expect a lot of those animals to be re highly related. We'll see a lot of pairs of kin, of kin pairs. If they're actually connected to other places, then we'll expect to see a lot lower degree of relatedness. So I think there's going to be a lot of useful stuff that will come out of that um, just by getting this data. So, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thanks very much.